This is Take Flights with Mark Little. So, it's just like real quick. I'll just show you a bit of the here. You start with your hands up. <laughs> All right. And your elbows come into your sides. And as you do, it's a sharp exhale through the nose. So you breathe in on the way out. I was so nervous I was going to oh, bogey. Me too. Me too. <laughs> Did you feel better though? Mm. Yeah. Feel energised? Yeah. Really, guy, I actually do feel more energised. It's worked quite well. You ready? Yeah, let's go. David Bertwistle, welcome to the Take Flight Podcast. What's up, Mark? How you doing, mate? Oh, mate, I'm good. We've just had an amazing lunch together. We have. It was romantic. It was cute. It, heart, it was the heart of Soho. Yeah. You know, two guys lunching together on a... Tuesdays, nothing weird about that. Nothing wrong with it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, this has been at long last because, well, I actually don't think I actually asked you for ages, did I? But I've been meaning to have you on for as long as I can remember, really, since I met you, really. Mm. So maybe two years later, we're finally doing it. I know, but there's been this big thing called COVID that kind of got in the way a little bit as well, didn't it? So. Mm. It's understandable, mate. I'm not taking it personally. It messed up our plans. <laughs> it did. <laughs> but we've got a lot to talk about, so we have an hour to try and fit it into. Let's do it, man. Um, so where should we start? I guess, do you know what? I always like to start with where where we know one another from. We've got lots of mutual friends. And the first time we met was at um, one of my events in 2019, which was all around overcoming adversity. And I've, I know I've told you the story before, but I'll tell you it again. The thing I remember... One of the main things I remember about that evening was coming out halfway through, we did like a little interval bit. And I came out and I saw Ben Bidwell, who's a mutual friend of ours, obviously very tall, so stood out. Um, but he was one of the first people I bumped into and you were stood next to him and we had not met before at this point. And you just wrapped your arms around me and gave me a big hug. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, who's this legend? <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of been like that ever since really. We went to um, Michael, who was a speaker at that event's retreat and, and met each other there for the second time and that's where we got to know each other much more and um yeah yeah it's been awesome it was powerful like you know you go through that retreat we did with michael it was um we uncovered some stuff and we talked and we communicated and i think like when you've been through something with someone then you feel connected with them kind of moving forwards and that was that was really good and it's it's been a lovely start to our blossoming friendship <laughs> <laughs> we got paired together for part of it as well mm. and i can't actually remember what we because I, I think these happen a lot of times with memories is you don't always remember the context you remember the feeling and we were paired together for something i can't remember what it was i think it might have been the warrior one you know we were doing the four archetypes of of man um the warrior the joker the king and the lover i'm sure it was the warrior that we got paired for anyway it was a it was an exercise where we sat across from one another and while one of you talks, the other just has to listen. And as we were doing this, I just remember you were talking and it's, it could have been coming out of my mouth with how much it was resonating <laughs> with me. So um, Yeah, it's nice that that happened like that. Yeah. But it's now been two years since. It's been two years since. So, okay, that's that. all that stuff aside, but I'd love to dive into more of that. Like, what have you done around personal development and that sort of stuff for yourself since? But before we do, obviously, you know, during that period, you'd already recorded a show that went on to have huge huge success so i think it would be interesting to talk about how that show came about in the first instance and the process you went through and actually what made you decide to take the opportunity uh yeah so the show that mark's talking about is one that was on netflix it's called too hot to handle and um actually did pretty well i think it was watched by like 70 million people which is pretty fucking mental yeah. when you think about it um it all started way back in 2018. Like, I just got a random DM. Hey, David, we're, we're filming a new show for a large streaming service. Would you be interested in having a chat? No way. And I was like, well, yeah. I mean, I'm not one to just turn down opportunities. That was all I knew. So I then had, like, a couple of interviews and stuff. And then, yeah, I found out um, kind of end of 2018 that... I was going to be on it. And then we filmed March 2019. And then it came out April 2020. Mm. So it was like a long process, lots of waiting. And then obviously kind of going going through that and then it came out in a 
pandemic. Everyone's in lockdown. Every single person is in lockdown. Like this show is blowing up and my social media is like exploding and my inbox is constantly full. And yeah, I stand outside and I can't see anyone in central London. Like it was this crazy contrast of like, it honestly just reminded me of, of 28 days later, you know, and he wakes up from the hotel, from the hospital even, he's walking around central London, there's no one around. And he's like, what's going on? And he doesn't know what's what's happened. Like that was what it was like in central London, wasn't it? It was crazy empty. And yet social media was just exploding. So it was this real crazy contrast, mm. really crazy. But now we're like a year on and the season two is out and two, yeah. the world is moving on and the UK is out of lockdown and it is a new time. But that, but the, the show, I think, you know, we talk a lot about taking that leap of faith, right? Taking a chance with something or taking a flight. And <laughs> for people listening, there was a bird impression. That was, that was me visually taking flight yeah. and putting a sound to the to action. Be fair, your lats are probably. <laughs> Been drinking so much Red Bull, mate. I feel like I can fly. <laughs> but to get a DM like that, what, what came to mind for me was I get loads of DMs. I haven't got a big profile or Instagram by any stretch and certainly not in comparison to you but I, I would ignore a lot of those because I think I'm just so used now to getting frankly crap DMs about wanting to grow your Instagram profile or just, just oh, yeah. bullshit stuff so annoying yeah but you got a DM about a big streaming platform <laughs> yeah. and like, you got a kind of like so what was that for you did it just spike your interest and you thought why not or what well what, what I think doing? when opportunities come at you you should always do your best to try and understand what that might be, what it could be, what the potential return on that in investment is. And, you know, I'm thinking, well, it's, this is a major worldwide streaming service is what they described it as. They never said Netflix to start with. I was like, right, well, that's likely to be either Netflix, Amazon, maybe Hey You, um, although it wasn't very big at the time, or maybe YouTube, um, cause YouTube has been doing mm. a few original things. So I was like, right, well, if it's on one of those platforms, it's probably going to be quite good. So I was like, well, it's worth having the meeting. It's worth having the conversation. So then I had the meeting and, and, um, again, like always trying to figure out like, how is the person, how's the casting agent, um, approaching it? What kind of questions are they asking? Like, what is the way that they're, talking to you and are they organized like all of these little things like you can get red flags you can get green flags and like throughout the process early on when I hadn't met anyone yet the process was just like green flags mm. you know it was yeah there's obviously certain questions coming up talking about sex or relationships and you know depending on what your comfort levels are with that kind of stuff it might have been a red or a green flag but once I'd had that and then I went into the office I was like right this is this is legit. Like it was made by Talkback, which is a massive UK production company that make like X Factor and loads of mm. top UK TV. So I was like, right, if these guys are doing it, it's going to be highly likely to be a good show. Um, and then I was getting more and more confident it was going to be on Netflix just from like the conversations that we were having. And then one day I got a contract through and at no point had I been told it was Netflix and then the contract said Netflix on it. And I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. If it's on Netflix, I'm in. Because like Netflix makes such good TV. Mm -hmm. Like the production value is great. They're like an industry leader in it. And I was like, right, if they're pumping money into a new show, a new concept, then it's likely to be quite good. It's unlikely to be trashy reality shows that are just about ag and drama and stuff. And that was something that I'd always said from the start because I, I had my um, my pre-existing business at that point. Like I was already doing online coaching, like fitness and nutrition coaching. And so the last thing I wanted to do was jeopardize that business by doing something that was going to be shit. Yeah. So I said to the, the producers, I said to the casting directors, like, just tell me now what the purpose of it is. Like, tell me now what the the theme, the feeling that you're trying to elicit from this show. Mm. Uh, because if it's anything aggy, if it's anything about drama, if it's anything like negative, you can just count me out. I won't do it. And if I get there and find out it is, I will just leave. 
I was like so adamant about this. So I was like, I'm not putting myself in a position to jeopardize a pre-existing reputation that I've got. Um, like if you get 100,000 or 200,000 or 500,000 followers for doing something bad, that's never going to convert into business or your your reputation as an individual is going to be damaged. And so I was like, there's, I don't want fame. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like that's not the point. It's not worth kind of selling yourself just to be on TV, just to have done something. So I was like really straight up with them about that. But they were always so like, trust us, it's going to be good. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to be positive. Like, da, da, da. I'm like, fine. Okay, cool. So Man, that's, <laughs> that's absolutely huge. Yeah. I really felt it when you were saying that because what you're talking about is standards. Mm. And we all have a standard to adhere to or, or not if we choose not to. But like even when you're you you know you're in an interview process to be potentially on this show, but you're talking about interviewing them as well by noticing how they are, if they're on time, if it's clean, if it's like you're noticing things about their own standards and their values to see if it matches with you. I didn't. Yeah. Think you'd, that's that's amazing. I didn't. Yeah, think yeah. It's like how I constantly like when I'm working with new people or getting opportunities that might come through. I'm always kind of thinking about this alignment between my expectations and, and standards and what theirs are mm. like and if they align. And yeah, that was that was really important. I also, the, the other thing was like, I knew that if I'm doing something like this, my parents are going to watch it. Mm. I knew that for a fact. And my sister and my brother would watch it and my friends would probably watch at least the first episode. <laughs> And then inevitably stop watching it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so I was like, well, I've got to, I've got to behave in a way and it's got to match what my parents and my family would expect from me. Mm. So that was something that was always really important. Yeah. I, I also thought what you said around the, um, you said red, uh, red flags and green flags, but I, have you, I don't know if you've read the Matthew McConaughey book, Green Lights. No. You would love it. It's the same. It's same. What you've just said, really. You should have written his. <laughs> but how you? Matt stole my idea. Yeah. <laughs> but how these green flags or green lights? Like these are the things that show us the way. It, it, like, but we need our standards to know what those green lights are and versus red lights, right? Mm. Like, just to be able to distinguish between the two, because ultimately, who we become is based on the decisions that we make. And I think, you know, you making that decision based off of it aligning with your values means that when it did become very successful, you didn't feel lost in that world of overnight fame or overnight success. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely been a massive adjustment period to it. Um, but I think because I stuck true to who I was when we were filming and I didn't do anything that I wasn't. I couldn't justify mm. then it was never a case of anxiety ridden because mm. I was like oh, it will just be fine like okay people might not like my personality but that is just me mm. I can't change that um or I don't want to change that because mm. that is me but I didn't do anything bad you know I didn't cause problems I wasn't like antagonistic so I was like, oh, it's going to be fine. But like, you know, the show came out. It did really well. People loved it. We were in a pandemic, which probably helped a little bit with like the viewing yeah. numbers and stuff. But there's, yeah, like overnight success. People are like, who is this guy? And like, he's, I, oh, that's David from Too Hot to Handle. You're like, well, actually, there's quite a lot more to me than yeah. just doing this reality show. That's the thing you know me for. But like, I've also been running Endeavor Life personal online coaching for the past 10 years. Mm. You know, like um, I've got two degrees. Like one's in strength and conditioning, those in petroleum engineering. Like I'm a well versed, well rounded individual, but you just see me as like this guy that was on Netflix, yeah. and like I understand that because you wouldn't know. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Like now, I suppose a year later, the second season's come out. Okay, well, how can how can I kind of continue to live my life being true to who I am, who I was, and also live into who I could be. And that's something that actually really recently I actually had a bit of a transitional moment because the truth is when when I was younger, I got called arrogant, right? So when I was a teenager, even before that, I'd be called arrogant. And I don't know if it was because I was covering up insecurity, my kind of cheeky behavior is a defense mechanism or just who I was. Um... But like I was always cheeky at school, like always 
talking, always had right like the answers for everything. Like so when when I was sixteen I actually got selected to play rugby for England. Right. So I was like really like this is one of the proudest moments of my life. I remember the exact moment when I was at my mum's house and like this letter came through the door and I looked at it and it's got the England stamp, like the rose on it on the outside. And I'm like, oh, fuck, this is this moment. This is the moment I either know I've got into England or not. And I'm like, stood there with my mum and my brother. Like, open this letter, start reading it. Dear David Burtwistle, after careful consideration, um, we have decided that we would like to invite you along to our training camp. And I'm there and I'm like, oh my God, mum, oh my God. Like, I was so happy. This like insane moment of like pure bliss, joy, exhilaration, energy, intensity. Like it was everything that I wanted, you know, in that moment. And I was so happy and so excited and so proud of myself for it because rugby was something that I loved. And then as soon as that information kind of filtered through at school, you know, because I'm 15 at this time, like year 11 at school. And then it's just like, you know, the, the teacher's obviously very proud, you know, standing up in assembly and saying like, congratulations to David, all that kind of stuff. But like, I get teased constantly. People would take the piss. Like, even if it's not because they're trying to bully me, it would be like, oh, Superstar. Superstar was the name, right? Superstar is my nickname. And so with all of this attention, I then started to like, kind of play it down play it down play it down play it down like I think it's because as well you got in the UK our culture is not to be proud kind of mm. if we're honest we're proud to be British but we're not proud of our achievements we don't show them off we don't like talk about ourselves in a positive way generally we play everything down and so whether it's learnt behaviour, whether it's because I was worried about being called arrogant whether it was because of n nicknames and stuff I like would play it down. I'd play it down when people bring it up. I would put my head down. I would shrink. And the reason I bring that up was because a very similar behavioral pattern occurred when Too Hot to Handle came out. Mm. I began to shrink. And my personality of who I am now as a 31 year old man, very sure of who I am, like, been through a big personal development journey over the past five six years and still looking to move forward and still looking to progress as a human but when people would bring it up when fans would come up and say hi when you know friends would talk about it I'd always play it down and I would put my head down a little bit and I'd be like instead of saying yeah yeah, yeah no I did this thing it's really cool I'd be like yeah no yeah and just stop talking about it probably through the, the same fear, the same behavioural pattern as when I was 15. And then last week, two weeks ago, I went to my friend Becky Rabin. She launched a book and it's called You Are Powerful, right? It's the everyday secret to manifestation. Now, I'll be honest with Becky, she knows this. <laughs> I used to think that was a bunch of bollocks, if I'm honest. <laughs> the whole manifestation thing was never really my like cup of tea. I thought, like, it's one thing to think something, but then you have to act upon it. And my belief of manifestation was purely just, like, ask and the universe will provide. Mm -hmm. And I was like, nah, ask and then you put the work in and then it happens. Yeah. Anyway, so I went to her book launch to celebrate her with her and, like, very proud of her for achieving this. And then I took the book and I'm, like, reading through it. And, like... The first couple of pages I'm reading and this book's talking about your vibrational force. As a human being, we all have this vibrational force and like how high vibes come from like positivity and uh, you know happiness and pride and um, like positive pride even and uh, celebrating your achievements and all of these high vibrational frequencies. And then the low vibe stuff is kind of self-deprecation and uh, pushing yourself down and anxiety and sadness and all these kind of low vibrational feelings. And I was reading it and I was like, I just like had this kind of moment of like, fuck, I'm doing the same thing I did when I was 15. I'm not living into who I am. And there's so many people out there that have 
seen the show and liked it and enjoyed it and they'll come up to me and they'll say hi and ask for a photo and stuff like that and we'll have chats about it or whatever and it's like a nice thing for for them right they're meeting someone they never thought they'd meet but I'd always been playing it down and I just had this moment of stop doing it stop it like be proud of who you are like it's a thing that you've done people enjoy it and it's okay to be proud of something and it's okay to live into that and you don't have to play yourself down you don't have to think people are you don't have to believe people will think you're arrogant just because you've done something you're talking about the thing that you've done um and once i had that kind of changing moment in my head my vibrations <laughs> started to go <laughs> up <laughs> And my energy started to to go up and then I'd start having these little random conversations with people and start having like little bits of banter with them. And then that's my personality coming out, which hadn't been happening. You know, I was still kind of going through this process of getting used to the impact of the show mm. still a year later. And... Um, I don't know, we just went for lunch. And a kind of a key example of this is when the waitress comes over, she's asking us about whether whether you want the super green smoothie, right? Mm -hmm. And so then we, <laughs> then I think it's a great idea to start bantering her about how super is the super green smoothie mm -hmm. on a scale of one to super, how super is it? And like, although this might not sound particularly exciting for you guys listening, it's more just then we had this cool interaction and we had this banter and that's my personality i like to do this with people and it's something that i wouldn't have done beforehand because i was shutting down and i've just been like yeah cool thanks and how much did that change her energy change what we learned about her in an instant like she just came over to our, take our order but then and it ha i actually noticed you did it a few times right you did it with um there was a lady who uh she had the wine and, and she yeah. made a joke about it, it was her wine yeah like, that, that wouldn't have happened. that was her personality then coming out yeah so the moment you drop uh, we drop our facade our persona whatever that thing is that we've decided to create which like protects us or keeps us secure like that's when we become ourselves and it draws out other people and mate you've just touched on something that is massive and it's the it's the intricacy or the nuance of our internal dialogue so there's there's a fine line between, in your case, right, being proud or being ashamed. Like withdrawing, low energy vibration, shame, proud, chest out, you know, humble, but proud of what you've done. Yeah. And the same thing with, you know, we can use this over and over again, confidence and arrogance. Yeah. Confident, like you said, self-assured, you know who you are. Arrogant overly portraying that feeling of confidence from a place of insecurity more likely and this is a lot of people will f will might be listening and, and registering after w the way you've just explained that because it's all going on internally in our minds in, in our bodies actually as well when we talk about vibration but in our minds we've we're, we're coming from that place and it, it, it's their fine lines between those two all the time and the other ones that you know the, pr the pride and the confidence they're the ones that make you feel good mm. massively it really was quite interesting because it happens um, subconsciously as well. Mm. You don't you don't know what's going on. You're automatically reacting to something and then you have to like take a little moment to self-analyse and think hmm. about yourself. What's that word? Reflective. You have to become reflective. What, what, what would you do then? Is it literally a case of just pausing or are you just noticing or...? It was just a wake-up call from reading Becky's book. It was like her talking about it and I was like, oh shit. It was just like, a, that was the key that unlocked it for me that where I was like, oh, I've actually been doing this again. Like, what are you doing, mate? Like, and was, was the trigger the attention, do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was exactly it. It was the mm. attention. It was just people say, like saying stuff or whatever. And um, I think it was probably just the link, yeah. I think that's a great thing for people to know because they would look at you for sure and think that you were like, just take that attention in your stride because you're outgoing, extroverted, mm. you know, bubbly personality and think that you'd, you know, you take it in your stride. Yeah, well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of assumptions that people would make about myself and something that I had when, um, when I was like in my mid twenties, common thing, like go on holiday, if I meet new people, they'd be like, oh, you're actually a nice guy. 
I'm like, what do you mean actually? They're like, oh, I, just, I thought you'd be a dickhead. <laughs> like, and that's because they've just judged me like prematurely without getting to know me. And so I suppose there's like a component of that to it as well. But like the actual attention, like, you know, it's people recognizing me doesn't boost my ego. I don't get like a hype from it, mm. you know, because I'm not, I don't, I guess I don't really need that validation. It's just this sweet, I don't know, it's every now and then something really sweet will happen. Like I went to dinner the other night with my mate talking to him exactly like this and um, saying about how I'm going to kind of embrace it and, you know, go with it and, and live into it. And then literally walking back to my moped and, and this 14-year-old girl was just sweeping the front of a grand shop. And she was like, oh, my God, you're David from Two Hot Handle. I was like, yeah, hey. She's like, oh, my God, hi. Like, oh, can I get a photo? Like, and she was so sweet, this girl called Sophia. We had a nice little chat about how she was working to help out her nan when none of her friends are working until they finish their GCSEs. And so mm. we just had this really cool little conversation and it was this pure moment of like, she's really excited. I had an, I got really excited off the back of seeing her excitement and it was just, it was lovely. And we did a couple of Snapchats and stuff and then, you know, I left her to finish sweeping up. It was like, it was nice, but it's, um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, like in, a, in a world where we're like more and more disconnected although technologically speaking we're more connected than ever but we're we feel more disconnected you're having real connections with people mm. and with, with real people yeah sweet how um if people were listening to this thinking how can i be myself more and like step into that because and it may, maybe you even want to use the example of while the filming was happening, right? Because I imagine that was an extra pressure of knowing there's a record button on, the camera's on you. How can we truly be ourselves? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> big question. I, mate, honestly, the biggest thing, there's there's two, right? Two massive things that really, really help. The first one is talk, right? This is a very simple one. Talk to your mates. Talk to your mates about you, about them and listen and, and engage with them and start the conversation with how do you feel? Not, are you all right? Not, you okay? Like, how do you feel? How do you feel about X? How do you feel about Y? And then, you know, if they go, oh yeah, no, it's all right, and try and fob it off, you go, that's not really how you feel though, is it? Like, what emotions are you feeling? And then you start having a conversation about emotion and about this like deeper thing within us rather than a superficial surface layer conversation. And then, you know, you have this back and forth with your friend and it starts to unlock the, the depth. And I start to visually perceive this as like the surface is like, you know, topsoil or whatever. And you dig down and you unlock deeper and deeper layers of your mind and actually you, once you've kind of unlocked them they're already there and you can access them all the time it's really easy once you've already unlocked them once you the difficult thing is doing the digging to get down mm. but having a friend or a person or a family member that you can have those conversations with i think that's the first thing because you have to become self-aware you have the question the conversations with them you understand how they feel they ask you you understand how you feel and then you you slowly just grow and develop as a result of having these conversations. That's my biggest thing, I'd say. So the, the number one was talk and was number two listen? Yeah, effectively, it was, yeah. 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 The, the, the question, how do you feel? How do you feel? And that's something I picked up from doing too hot to handle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was funny because always the producers would ask us, ask Mark, how does he feel about X, hmm. right? It wasn't ask Mark about this. It was always, how do you feel? Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. And I started to realize there's this pattern. And I've um, just filmed another TV show. And uh, if you haven't seen it, it's on Channel 4. It's called Love Trap. And again, the producers are asking me within this filming process, oh, how does so-and-so feel about that? How are they feeling? How are you feeling about this? And I really, re I, it, I, I realized it's that question. And they deliberately do it to unlock what's in your mind. How do you feel about X? Mm. Not what do you think, how do you feel? Because that gets the layer deeper. Mm. Like, mate, I always love it. I've said this to you so many times, but I always love it when we talk because I feel like we're such on a level with how we see things. But wh where did your, you talked about the top layer and the digging down. Like, where did your digging start? What, what digging have you done f for yourself to build your own self-awareness? Oh, 
many years now, man. Like, when did it start? Like, mid-20s, maybe, properly. Mm. Um, I wasn't really very self-aware early 20s. It was quite nice to be naive and ignorant, yeah, yeah. if I'm honest. I think of back, back to that time <laughs> a lot, like, oh, simpler. There's a bliss time. in it. Um, yeah. Ignorance is bliss to a certain degree. You know, when I was in my in my early 20s, like I'd just broken up with a long-term girlfriend. I was fully embracing single life, mm. you know, dating loads of girls, going to festivals, going on holiday, just, you know, literally living a carefree early 20s life and it was fucking brilliant i'm not gonna lie i had so much fun mm -hmm. wouldn't change it um but then i started to do this introspective work because i realized there was a lot of pain coming on from that breakup from that relationship that i was carrying with me and i had to start then talking about that with friends and with family to start understand it process it because what happened was i just shut it down and then basically when i get really drunk i just cry and it would be like, okay, I'd, I'd have to get to drunk enough to a point where that that emotional wall would break and then I'd cry. And I realized that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's obviously something wrong there if that's what happens. <laughs> How long was this happening for? Oh, years. A couple really? of years, yeah, yeah. And was it uh, like a high school sweetheart, that kind of early relationship? It was, or? we started dating like early, uh, second year of uni. Okay late second year of uni we were together for like four years lived together mm. for two like really loved her um and yeah it just was it was yeah, a lot of pain to deal with it like i was definitely largely to blame for our breakdown in the relationship and um but that's you know just being immature yeah. you live and learn from your mistakes and it's okay not to be perfect from the start but yeah so that was kind of the 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 first step was trying to understand the pain from that relationship and then it kind of continued to go from there and what was the what was like stage two after you had the self-awareness to see that that wasn't particularly a healthy way to live what did you do next well it was mainly just once i had realized that there was work to be done i started to become more open to the idea that Ah, uh, I'm not perfect. <laughs> oh, there's loads of shit I could be better at. <laughs> and it's like that um, thing, like once you know, you know what you, what is it? You don't know what you don't know. You know what you know, you don't know what you don't know. But then when you start to know what you didn't know, you realise there's a lot more you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. And so that really? was quite I complicated, but that makes sense. So hopefully <laughs> to the listeners it's that, that made um, sense. Unconscious consciousness. Mm. When you don't know what you, you you know, and it goes in a loop until you realise how fucked up you are. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, oh cool. Actually, and then there was, you know, a bunch of people like yourself and, and Ben Bidwell and like my mate Josh that, that talk about these things and then I just started being like, Oh, this is cool, quite interesting to have conversations like this and start to understand understand myself and then question things and it just yeah snowballed mm. so so we talked about understanding who we are and i think such an important part of that for you before you went on the show was that interview process with them and checking in with like the standards and all that stuff that we spoke about i've spoke about this with you before but i'd love to get it on the podcast about managing and again we talked about the attention already but managing the way you feel about going from it was like 25,000 followers or something to 1.2 million mm. in a space of weeks and as you said at the beginning during a pandemic no one around to kind of see how it's changed physically it was just all on your phone uh, what was what was that process like where everything on social media just went wild for you confusing and intense the interesting thing was I was like so adamant that I would not change as a person, mm. right? I was like, no, I'm going to be exactly the same person that I always have been. And then I realized that actually like my situation has changed and it's okay to embrace the things that have come along with this. And that desire to remain the same mainly came from the fear of judgment of other people saying, oh, he's changed. Mm. Oh, he did the show. Now he thinks he's big time. <laughs> oh, David. <laughs> I say it was the fear of that 
that made me think I need to stay the same. Mm. So it's huge, man. Yeah, it was huge. Uh, um, but like over over the year since the show's come out, that I've like grown and and evolved and actually like it's it's all right to change as your situation changes as your world changes as your environment changes as your opportunities change like that is us as people we are supposed to evolve and grow like evolution for fuck's sake mm -hmm. it's what we do right it is what we do and we can do it on a daily basis and that is what i realize it's, it's okay to change it's okay to embrace new opportunities that come my way i was always so fearful of being called an influencer because of the reputation that influencers get of just flogging shit and selling booty and teeth whitening strips mm -hmm. and generally not being the smartest cookies. Mm -hmm. And again, that was through fear of judgment of people saying, oh, he's a fucking influencer. Oh, just doing this and that and da da da. And fear of judgment. But then I'm like, you know what? Like, I, I, I'd have to delete my Instagram account to change this. And it's not worth that because I'll be honest, I get loads of free shit and I get really <laughs> cool opportunities and it's a really nice thing to have, right? Mm -hmm. And I just embrace it and it's part of work now. Like it is my life and that's okay to have that. And um, just, I think about being being open to change, to grow, to adapt and evolve. And, and it's normal as a human to do that and we will continue to do it. And actually, if you don't change, you know, it's adapt or die, isn't it? That's the evolutionary process is adapt or die. I wrote down a quote off your website. Oh, yeah. Which says, if you never try, you'll never know. If you never fail, you'll never grow. Yeah. That's that's a motto I live by. Mm. Yeah, I got that one and actions reflect priorities. That's mm. another one. Yeah, if you never try, you'll never know. If you never fail, you'll never grow. And it's for me, that's so important because so many people are scared of doing something. They don't even try. They don't even give it a, a, an opportunity. And so they're still in the same position. And I'm like, but if you don't try it, you won't know if you could have done it. If you don't just give it a go, you're still in the same position. I'm like, if you try and you fail, you're still in the same position you were if you didn't try. Mm -hmm. Right? So just give it your best shot. With the benefit of the lesson from failing. Exactly. Because <laughs> like failure is really only failure if you don't take anything from it. Mm. If you learn from your mistakes, then you're already steps ahead of where you were because you now have more knowledge. And knowledge gives you perspective and that perspective allows you to grow as a human. So like for me, that first part portion of the quote is really important. And then if you never fail, you'll never grow is, is the second part for exactly that. If you like, if you're only successful cool all right that's fine it's a nice and easy way to get there but if you never fail at something then it's very hard to grow from that experience you often don't grow from the things that are easy you grow from the things that are hard the things that you struggle with and it's something i've got from training it's something i've got from like my fitness is you have to fail in the process of getting fit of getting big of getting lean of like performing in your sport you have to fail Every single workout I fail because mm. there'll be reps that I can't complete. Mm -hmm. And like I might put down like three sets of 12 and I put a weight on the bar and I get 12, 11, 10. Am I a failure because I missed three reps? No, I'm not. I'm a success because I gave it 100% effort mm. and that's okay. As long as you give 100% and you commit fully to the process, then you're a winner. As long as you commit, as long as you do your best. And it's, it's something that my, my parents always said to me is like we don't care if you're first or last as long as you do your best mm. I'm like, at the time i didn't quite understand it if i'm honest mm. i'm like a teenager or a kid and they're saying this and i'm like yeah cool thanks man <laughs> i want to win and then <laughs> but now as an adult i'm like actually just do your fucking best mm. just give it your all and then you're going to be proud of yourself no matter what so good, mate. I love the analogy of the gym as well because so many workouts are to failure. That's mm. the, they're designed to for us to work to failure, and because we can see it physically, it makes sense. But as I'm listening to you speak, maybe your biggest workout for your mind, when we put that to, under the t uh, like under to the test as a workout or however you want to view that, is was going on the show and being exposed to 70 million people watched it. 1.2 million then watched you mm. daily. Mm. 
it's funny, man. I just had three weeks off social media because I recognized that my I'd become incredibly reliant on it. The moment I felt uncomfortable, even typing an email and I'm, I got blocked in a sentence I was writing or I'm sat at lunch and someone goes to the toilet, I'm immediately looking at it because I'm on my own. And, and I just didn't like that feeling anymore. And I was looking at it the moment I woke up and that wasn't like a thing that I used to do. And I took three weeks. I was, uh, was going to take one week off. I ended up taking three weeks off. And I actually didn't want to go back on. The only reason I did is because I need to announce this event in October. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be pre presenting to myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I just realized how how negative it can be for us if we allow it to be. So yeah, one of the things that I thought you were particularly strong at and having a great view on is your following and how it goes up and how it goes down. Mm. And well, you keep saying 1.2 and it's actually only at 1 million now. Well, it's... <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Exactly, right? But So it fluctuates. <laughs> but you, you're always in and around there somewhere. Yeah. And that can, for some people, have a massive impact on their own self-worth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting because, like, it actually even went up to 1.3 million at one point. Mm. And then over the past year, I've lost, like, 300,000 followers. And now it's that it's around a million and it's kind of level. Um, but it goes up and it goes down. Like I look at the analytics and there might be like 4,000 new followers a week, but 4,200 have unfollowed me. And I'm like, you know what? It's, it's fine. Like you're not going to be someone's cup of tea all the time. Someone might know you for one thing and then they don't like the content that you're putting out. And I don't know. It's It's, it's an interesting one for me. The numbers of followers that you have is not really that important unless you need it for your job. Your number of followers doesn't dictate your self-worth, your beauty, your humour. And like I'm fortunate enough to be old enough to know what life's like without social media. And it was brilliant. <laughs> like it actually was fantastic. And there's I've said it so many times when people ask like, about social, I'm like, if it wasn't part of my job, if I hadn't created a life where I needed it, I wouldn't have it because it isn't actually that great a lot of the time. And a lot of the people on there are not that positive influences and it is often a highlights reel, and, but it can be quite positive. But there's certain things you can do and like definitely limiting yourself um on your social media having like a notification pop up if you've been using the app for too long um turning your notifications off um ghost posting right so like if you're going to post something on instagram post it and then put your phone somewhere and don't look at it mm. again for x amount of time until you've forgotten that you posted something I love that ghost post yeah ghost post it's right. it's it's game changing because then you're not like oh how did it do yeah. oh how did it do yeah. and i go to check and like the worst thing is notifications. Turn off your notifications. It's game changing. You post something, the last thing that you actually need as a human being is a notification every time someone likes it. Because mm. every time someone likes it, you get that serotonin and dopamine hit. And then if you don't get as many, that so serotonin and dopamine doesn't happen. And then you're like, oh no, why? Yeah. And you become overly critical. But let's be honest, guys, no one cares about your posts as much as you care about your <laughs> posts. <laughs> no one gives a fuck. Like, this is the truth. Like, you don't need to take 50 photos for that one photo that goes on Instagram. I don't. That's for fucking sure. So just, just be a bit more like careless, if I'm honest. Mm. Careless about it. It's... Also, the thing, I don't know, like, social media for girls especially is, I think, maybe, I don't know, even more damaging, but it's fucking hard for them because it's effectively like this beauty pageant most of the time. And most girls don't look like their Instagram. It's, like, it's happened to me multiple times <laughs> where I've talked to a girl on social and been like, oh, my God, she's a goddamn 10. Like, this girl is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. And I meet her and I'm like, oh, like, you're not ugly, but you're definitely not a 10. Like, and that's because they're using fucking filters and they're using Facetune and they're putting on all of this extra makeup and doing 100 photos to get one. And it just reinforces with all the women out there that they don't live up to that expectation of what the standard is like. And honestly, it's, it's, it's bad. I think I was watching Love Island the other day <laughs> hmm. for the first time <laughs> in years. And, um, 
it was actually with Becky again, Becky Rabin, the girl that brought out the book, um, You're Powerful. And we were looking at the guys and looking at the girls and all the girls got this makeup on. And then Becky's like, we're talking about how girls often look so different when they've not got makeup on. And I'm like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if Love Island didn't allow makeup? Wouldn't it be cool? Like, and then you would actually just see what women look like mm. all the time. And then we'd get used to that as being the beauty standard. It's it's an interesting situation. Like, you've got real life, how you wake up and how you look or how you look after a shower. And then guys continue to look exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then girls put on however much makeup and then they look different. And then they have 50 or more photos and then they edit those photos. So then you're you're so far from how you wake up that I think that even girls forget mm. how they look. And then their standard of good is just the photo that's fully edited yeah. on their Instagram. And when they wake up, they look at themselves and they're in like, oh, I don't look like my Instagram feed. I'm like, well, of course you fucking don't. Mm. Like, you're not gonna. It's, it's a different way of saying the be yourself thing and owning yourself, isn't it? It's exactly the same thing. It's difficult, though. We were talking about this at lunch with me about like convention and how we've been led to believe that a certain way of living is what should be done and what, mm. and what we should follow. And that's probably one of the best examples, right? How, how long have women been expected to do that? I think things are changing. I think things are changing. Possibly, I think, maybe in the world that you're in, not as quickly. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it is, it is changing a little bit. I mean, so, social media is definitely getting more positive. I think reality TV is getting more positive. Definitely contrasting like 10 or 15 years ago. Mm. But yeah, it's it's hard because if there is a standard, if there is a norm, you you effectively have to learn that that is, an, that is a created standard and then you have to challenge it. Mm. So you have to be aware enough and cognizant to be able to question yeah. and then find a solution that works for you, that works with your values. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. You've got to be so disciplined. And those days when you're having a low day and it feels even more difficult to be disciplined is... That's why I'm, I'm, I'm a black and white person. So I've just got to come off social media. I've just got to get away from it. And then you realise what's important, actually, that our reality is out here. It's not in our phones. And actually, like you said, no one gives a fuck about your profile, your posts or anything else as much as you do. So stop putting so much of an emphasis on it. Getting away from that, I'm, I'm, I tend to agree with you that I wouldn't go on it if I didn't have to. Because mm. we, you then choose the content you digest rather than being served something from an algorithm. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's definitely benefits to it, though. Like, if you as a creator choose what you put out mm. and if you're in tune then you can positively impact other yes, people I love that yeah and like that's something I, I always think of is how can I write something how can I create something that benefits the people that I'm influencing yeah. for lack of a better word mm -hmm. and then you can choose the people that you see and, and whatnot. but again you have to be aware enough to do this and it's very easy to fall into the trap of just posting for narcissistic reasons mm, yeah. and just using Instagram as a dating app. Yeah, it's one of the uh, <laughs> one of our most ingrained habits is to be narcissistic as humans. We all are to a certain degree. Yeah, we're well, animals, aren't we? Mm. Like animals, the natural world is a narcissistic place. You got what's the best looking peacock? You know, yeah. peacocking is called peacocking yeah. for a fucking reason <laughs> because peacocks show off how great they look. <laughs> And attract mates. And so does most of the animal world. Like, we are animals. Let's remember all of this. <laughs> yeah. We are animals. But hopefully a little bit smarter than a peacock. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. And look a little bit better than the, the best peacock. But we are going to take flight. <laughs> 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 mate, last one on this. Jim Carrey said he wished that everyone could be famous and rich to realise that that's not where happiness is. With your quote-unquote overnight success through Too Hot to Handle, what have you taken away from ultimately finding your own version of fame? I'm no happier with a million followers than I was with 20,000, than I was with 10. Like, happiness isn't your follower number. That is super important. Don't chase being an influencer. In fact, a lot of the effort, there's a lot of effort that goes into being an influencer, right? It is a job 
and you have a certain amount of time on this planet and you can either put time into creating a social media account and getting loads of followers to get free shit or you can just work, earn money and buy it. Mm. Like you have to do, they're both work, right? Um, so that's definitely one thing I would I would say. And it is it is a job having a large social media account if you want to fully maximize the opportunities that come from it if you want to work in media for example you have to go down but it's it's a job it's everything it's a job um the fame thing's an interesting one because i don't call myself famous some people just know who i am because i did the show but you know if there was a to z less of celebrities i'm z z z z um <laughs> so you know it's uh, people come up and say hi or whatever but it is it, it it's it's not i don't know it's just if you are looking to be famous because you think it's going to make you happy, then you're missing something in life already. Happiness for me is spending time with friends. It's connecting with my family. It's creating moments of togetherness. It's getting deeper with conversation and getting to know people. And <clears throat> it's embracing the highs and lows. Um, there's lots of things I find exciting and joyful. <clears throat> Music festivals, they're great fun, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I love doing adventure sports and, and adrenaline really excites me. But that's not happiness. Mm -hmm. I think happiness is, is contentment and embracing the process of what you're doing in life. Having the people around you that you love and being able to share your flaws and weaknesses with them because it's inherently when you expose yourself that people see you for who you are. And then your connection grows deeper with them. Mm. You, If you're forever guarded, then you're forever going to keep people away. Mm. Yeah, amazing, mate. It's so good. Oh, honestly, I absolutely love it. Like the, even the example of the adrenaline is that they're those kind of like fleeting moments that are great, amazing, not to take them away. They're, they're awesome. We should still seek those things. But knowing that the happiness and fulfillment really is what you're explaining there are those moments with, family friends those connections even the super green smoothie example <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um, what has been in your view now reflecting a year on what's been the biggest thing that you got from going on the netflix series like what's what's been your biggest takeaway what did it give you going on that show because i was already on a personal development journey it just continued to unlock that and it made me